figure in Harlem's activism in the 50s and the 60s. As you know, he became minister of Temple Num Number 7. In 1957, he organized in a moment, at a moment's notice, thousands of Harlemites on the corner of Lenox on 125th Street to confront the police beating of a Muslim, leading the police to remark that no black man should have that much power. And in Harlem, he met with Fidel Castro. He gave numerous speeches telling, telling us things as they were and not lying. Activism, resistance, and dissent have always posed a threat to the ruling class, and they have confronted it with various forms of state power and violence. In addition to the leaders we all know of who were assassinated, Harlem was also clearly a target with its history of resistance. The lived history, the lived experience of generations of African Americans produced in Harlem a political logic that emphasized the redistributive state, the political sphere, and the responsibility of government to its citizens. And this was, of course, at odds with the emerging, continuing, and past neoliberal ideology of everyone for themselves, unless you're rich. When I first began formal research in Harlem in the 1990s, Many of Harlem's activist organizations had been destroyed. Unemployment was rampant. The housing stock was increasingly destroyed. Abandoned buildings were everywhere. Neglect by the city and state government was more than evident. This was accompanied by rising police brutality and murders. Between 1992 and 1996, complaints to the city's complaint review board rose more than 60%. Beginning around 1985, Harlem was experiencing the crack cocaine epidemic that began in Los Angeles in 1982. We were at the time studying women and health, and by the end of our research project in 1996, all the women we were studying were visiting their partners, their brothers, their fathers, who were all incarcerated. We don't have time to go into this in detail, but I think we need to think about this. And this is an important time to think about the links among the assassination of our leaders. And think about it. Both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are assassinated at the time when they begin to talk about structural racism, to talk about class as well as race, to talk about organizing across the board, to talk about changing the structure of the society. The destruction of our political organizations, the criminalization of dissent, the expansion of, of dangerous illegal drugs in communities of racialized peoples through neglect or through destabilizing social institutions and political insurgency. The recent crack epidemic, think about it, allegedly followed, allegedly followed by the war on drugs, which is perhaps more accurately seen as a war of pacifica pacification against people of color. And this was the most single important factor in the increase in the prison population. The rise of the prison industrial complex, which the last spoke, uh, speakers spoke, just spoke about, or what we should probably now call the carceral state. This is a state that is now run on the basis of punishment and imprisonment. If you haven't seen it yet, consider seeing the feature film, The Messenger. Uh, it it's only starts to tell the beginning of the story. It was in the movies for about a nanosecond, but I can th think you can get it on Netflix. And uh, it talks about the question of how the CIA oversaw and was quite cognizant, cognitive of the importation of crack cocaine into South LA as a way to fund the Contras who were the forces against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. 
From there, it spread to all our major cities and destroyed our communities. Mm -hmm. This is not conspiracy theory. Uh, Maxine Waters investigated it. I went and read through all the congressional documents. The CIA did not deny it. Uh, so I think we need to think about these relationships and what, has, what happens with the assassination of our leaders, the destruction of our organizations, and the destruction of our country, of our communities. And it's useful to consider the question of how Harlem and the freedom struggle in black America might have developed had Malcolm and other leaders uh, Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton in Chicago, Walter Rodney, both of whom I knew had not been assassinated. What we were witnessing in the 1990s was the foundation for the gentrification of Harlem. In, Har in central Harlem, between 2000 and 2010, the black African-American non-Hispanic population decreased by 12%, the white non-Hispanic population increased by 80%. Now this is both class and race, but this is a, a makeover of what was a politically active center, a politically active community for all of the black world. On the positive side, if there is one, Harlem continues to be an international mecca for people of African descent with new African immigrants and Latinos including Afro-Latinos. So this brings me, I think, to a very important aspect of Malcolm X's ideology. Throughout much of his life, Pan-Africanism and internationalism was a major influence. His thinking was no doubt shaped by his childhood experiences with his parents who were active in the Garvey's, move, Garvey's movement and in Pan-Africanist movements. His travel throughout Africa and the Middle East profoundly affected his thinking with respect to both the potential universalism of Islam and the anti-imperialist struggles going on all around him. And we can follow the development of his reflections on anti-imperialism through his notes and speeches. His cumulative experiences led him to seek a fundamental restructuring of wealth and power, not only in the United States, but in other parts of the world as well. In this sense, he may have been in advance of some of the black leaders of the time in understanding that for the black freedom struggle to succeed in the United States, it must be linked to an international campaign for global anti-racism. Black liberation at home depends on an international vision. In closing, what are the lessons for us today? Clearly there are many, but key among them is Malcolm's continued commitment to global anti-racism and self-determination, and the importance of black lives across borders with respect to old and new forms of racism and the struggles against them. Malcolm was very impressed with the Bandung Conference. I suspect he would have been equally attracted to the concept of global apartheid that emerged from the UN World Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa in 2001. Global apartheid was defined as an international system of minority rule whose attributes include differential access to basic human rights, wealth and power structured by race and place, structural racism embedded in global economic processes, political institutions, and cultural assumptions, and the international practice of double standards that assume inferior rights to be appropriate for certain others defined by location, origin, race, and gender. I've recently spent some time in Brazil and in Colombia, and the struggles of Afro-descended and indigenous people must be one with our own. In Colombia, there's uh, a... 
In Colombia, there is an international effort to move Afro-Colombians off their historical land in the uh, uh, Pacific Coast. I'm sitting in a meeting, and similar to the United States, police appear, pull out some black Afro-Colombians, beat them up, put them in jail. And in Brazil in particular, uh, João Costa Vargas, for example, has written on the genocidal practices confronted by Afro-Brazilians, which distressingly echo the events that we, conf that we face here. And so the upside of globalization is the ease with which we can communicate with the new social movements developing all over the African diaspora and the potential to develop a unified struggle. And that's where we need to go. We need a unified global struggle against global apartheid. Finally, I think that Malcolm's greatest contribution and gift to us was his outstanding example of honesty, integrity, self-reflection, and unwavering commitment. And I'd like to end by echoing the words that conclude my late husband Manning Marable's biography of Malcolm X. He said, quote, I am deeply grateful to the real Malcolm X, the man behind the myth who courageously challenged and transformed himself, seeking to achieve a vision of a world without racism. Without erasing his mistakes and contradictions, Malcolm embodies a definitive yardstick by which all other Americans who aspire to a mantle of leadership should be measured. Thank you. to understand how urgent I think it really is. So let me ask y'all a question. How many people died in New Orleans as a result of Hurricane Katrina? That's the call and response people. What's, anybody know the answer? I want to take a guess. 3,000? More than that? No, it wasn't 100,000. The answer is we don't know. They didn't count. The United States government did not care enough to count, but it was concerned enough to conceal. Now I want you to think about that. Sit with that. Because it's not just that it's an uncontrollable force that's out there doing with impunity what it wants to do to black children and black people but that there's a larger agenda that we need to take some serious heed to and concern, be concerned with. And see, that, that project and that piece came out of that first experience of my being down in, in New Orleans for a couple of years. And realizing that this empire it perhaps reached a new phase and was entering into a new way of engaging African people in this country. And that our rhetoric, political rhetoric, that we have been uttering, at least as long as I've been alive, about genocide, that it might not be rhetoric anymore. Mm. That a black life was that disposable, that you don't even take enough concern to count. And you let bodies rot in containers, or, or rot in the street, and forbade people to find their loved ones or to connect. You give them one-way tickets to Alaska and tell them good luck. It's a different thing to go down to parts of the southern coast of Louisiana and you might be there for a month and see a little bit of marshland, a little bit of coastland and come back a month time. That's completely underwater. Not in five years. Right? In a month. 
it's believed on average that things like three or four football fields worth of land and, and along that whole coast region is, being, is, is gone every day, underwater every day. Think about what that means for your children and your grandchildren. And all the other species that are being kind of wiped off this planet by a ravenous capitalist industrial society that we got to stop. What we're trying to do, at least in our experience, and hopefully other people can gravitate and learn from it, again, is to create a little bit of space in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, and in Mississippi. And there's a lot of reasons why we have some opportunity to do that. One of the main reasons why we have an opportunity to do that that's not often spoke about is because it's not that uh, capital is not as deeply penetrated in that state as it is in other places. And what does that mean? It means in our political mobilizing that one person can equal or exceed one dollar of a political contribution campaign. That's a simple kind of a breakdown of the equation, right? But I can go talk to my neighbor, and you can still do that in Mississippi, very easily. I can go talk to my neighbor, sit down on the porch, break a little bread, explain where I'm coming from, and move them to say, well, this might be a little better option than what them folks up the street is, was offering. So you might want to consider this. And then, by the way, you might have a direct say if you get involved with some of these other institutions like the People's Assembly. You might have a more direct say in your own economic future if you help us build one of these co-ops. So very tangible, very concrete program that we're trying to build that tries to deal with everyday needs but do so in such a manner that each and every individual has more, more power, more and more stake in what takes place. And as that is built, it's going to be a little bit harder for the system to dismantle it. And that's the key component to it. Right? That's the key component to it. Is making sure that that individual organizing is, is sufficient to us to, to reach people in that manner. Now, don't, just because we won with Chalkway's election, don't get no uh, uh, over aggrandized things that we, we moved the mountain. We haven't yet. At best, I would say about 20% of the city is touched by organizing in some form or fashion. That's it, 20% of the city. And with that 20%, we've been able to do a little bit. But our goal is to make sure that we get 100 black, white, and everything in between. And the real aim and objective is not just to just take Jackson, but to take the state of Mississippi. Mm. That's not something that we hide. Yeah. That's not something that we hide or that we shy away from or back away from or try to change the how we speak about it. That's what we're going for. And so when you hear us, you know, talk about it, at least from the tradition that I come in, from free to land, we still mean that. The form has changed, the substance has changed, but the politics ain't went nowhere, right? It's still rooted in black people going to control our lives. And those people who want to live on the land with us in solidarity as humans, you're more than welcome to. Right? You're more than welcome to. Everybody can get down as equals and we can make a better world together. That's still the aim and objective, but we just identified that we have a, we, you know, one of the things about Mississippi that we analyzed about 10 years back when we started dra drafting this up, 70% of the people under 30 years old are black in, in the state of Mississippi. So you just do some basic math what they look like in 20 years, 25 years, 50 years. Then if we can convince a good number of, of white folks that them reactionaries they've been listening to all their life don't really make no sense, mm. y'all might as well get down with us. <laughs> we, can, we can share. We know how to share. We can share. We're not greedy. Not, not all of us anyway. We're not greedy. So we can share, we can do a little bit better than it was done to us. And then other folks who want to come in, or who are there, we encourage folks to come. You know, we need skill from wherever it is in the world. If you want to come and get down, that's the type of society we want to build. And try to do that in such a manner that we can, again, totally transform this thing from the inside out. So 
you know, self-determination, Tariq spoke about the, the world has changed. In a lot of fundamental ways, it has, but in certain fundamental ways, it's still the same. White supremacy is still dominating the show. We still live in a society where, you know, let's be honest, where, where African people assert their own humanity, that's deemed a threat to this society, to the powers that be. That's the society we still live in. So when people were talking about earlier about Malcolm being uh, viewed as the preacher of hate, all you got to do is speak well of yourself and your own people. That's still considered hate speech in this country. Still got a long ways to go. And we have to get, particularly a lot of the young folks who are out in the streets right now making some tremendous sacrifice, we got to get them in a, a, a deeper understanding of history. And what I mean by that, people know the brutality that they suffer on a daily basis from this system. But they haven't learned the full intent yet by which once this, the system is determined it's going to destroy a movement, what amount of terror it can and will employ. That's different than just the day-to-day -day brutality. So we got to get folks prepared and ready for that, because it's coming. They just, the immunity that, and the impunity to which they're acting and putting blatantly in our face, yeah, this, you know, he killed another little child, but he's going to walk away free. Even in the face of all the pressure that they've, you know, had to deal with thus far, we see fundamentally the actions haven't changed. So we got to step it up. So that is our task. We got to step it up.